and uh, come back and find out later. There should be a bit of a surprise going on there. I fully don't expect it to, but it may well pick up some audio. And I've got nothing wrong with a little blurred video. So, I... Okay, so you're filming that way. Uh, oh, I see where you're looking, you're filming that screen, not the screen I'm looking at. Ooh. I have a camera pointed at my computer screen, which to me seems to make sense. Hopefully that... Yeah, I get my lefts and right confused as well, right. to be honest. Right, I was thinking your cat. Uh, so, you're looking now at the, the, the camera. Um, oh no, I understand the confusion. I have multiple cameras organized here. Uh, professional operation, my friend. Now, only a single microphone, though, but it is made by Microsoft, so I assume it is of a reasonable quality. Um, of course, it has just started raining, which has to, hopefully doesn't rain too hard. <laughs> oh, I understand. Over and out. So, can you still... How's the, how's the rain working for you? I'll see if I can turn up my microphone game. We might have this worked out by the end of the evening, Stan. So tell me, how do UFOs work? <laughs> Where do you... You got to stay over. Oh, not just yet, my friend. All right, now... I, I hear the gravity is sort of encapsulating me in some sort of round ball surrounding my mass and if I want to float I need to create a rotating magnetic field now this is all very well in the, in the world of satire but in the real world I think it takes some electronics and some various uh, doodads yeah it does take uh Two uh, toroidal coils, one at one angle, one at another, to that same coil of the same inductive core, a hollow one, blue uh, metal. Uh, and you pulse the uh, DC current into one coil, then take the vacuum up and put it in phase with the next pulse into the, the other coil, and wrap it back and forth like that until your field diameter reaches, say, for a 30 foot craft, about 800 feet in radius, or sorry, in diameter. That is a deeply efficient way of using electricity, Stan. I've always been a big fan of recycling. It does bore the shit out of me, typically. But I do put my milk bottles in the bin around the side. Okay. Tell me, I hear the sea level is about 80 metres below... I mean, this is what I hear, you know? We've got about 80 metres of sea level rise to go. And people peg that as something in the vicinity of 10,000 years. So I'm not moving house anytime soon. But am I wrong in my assertion? Should I perhaps consider moving? Uh, how far above sea level are you? I'm currently about 40 metres, so I am in the danger zone, you might say. Eventually, but not immediately. I was hoping for my lifespan, it won't concern me, but the amount of wind and rain we've had this season... It is one... Uh, may I suggest that you go to bed... May I suggest that you go to bed with a fully inflated inner tube around you? That is a very elegant solution, my friend. <laughs> that would yeah. allay some of my fears, and perhaps I find an alternative use for it as well. You never know. <laughs> I think these things can be quite fashionable. And they prevent all sorts of problems, yes. Yes, it is a fashion statement. Well, I wish I had your rain here. It's, uh, we're lucky to be at 12 inches a year. 12 inches a year, yes. You should use my um, free energy technology stand. I'm most excited about it. It works on pretty much the same principles as that flying saucer, except you just put it through a heating element, and it seems to create steam and sort of fresh water. It's... Um, NASA don't return my emails, though, to be honest. Well, Just between more. you and me, it's a little frustrating. 
Now, I do plan on sending them more emails. Do you know how many... Patty, Patty, do you realize how many emails and phone calls we get a day? There's just two of us here. Uh, you and your darling Holly. She, she looks like a lovely girl, yes. Stan. I need to get a secretary for myself, I think. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm hesitant right, to speculate. So Say again. I think what I meant to say was over and out, but now that I've got another opportunity on the microphone, I was going to tell you that I actually don't get any emails at all, despite what I might like. I seem to have all the amazing technology on the face of the planet, and no one's in the least bit interested. But flying saucers, you seem to have garnished all my email interest, so this is all... I need a different publicist, I think, Stan. Patty, can you give me some clue more about uh, the device and it's uh, running your heating element to boil your water? Oh, sure. Well, I take great pride in the fact that um, one of my lifelong legends, Peter Lindemann, uh, failed miserably at his attempts uh, after publishing the circuit diagram. Uh, I'm, of course, studied in some rudimentary electronics, and it's all about what... Um, Paul Babcock calls the uh, the amazing switching technology, the um, a a a AST, I think he calls it. But um, what I've decided is that it's all about how you operate the switches, and specifically the speed by which you operate the switches. Now he's gone and used uh, SCRs for his design, which is the the equivalent of what you'd use for a light dimmer switch in a house. So they go up and down quite slowly. And it's really not ideal for high-speed switching. Uh, but I've determined transistors, uh, turning them off and on very quickly, is 100% the key to the system. Uh, on the oscilloscope, if you can get a nice dead straight line going down as you turn it off, uh, that will change the efficiency from what Lindemann was getting, which was about perfectly normal in any mainstream textbook to what I'm getting, which is about 2,500% um, efficiency. And, and I suspect that if I was to invest so, in more than a couple of hundred dollars of tech, I could probably get it better. Okay, so are you saying that you're uh, like using an over unity device to take advantage of the elastic rebound from the fluid of space? That is how I've always liked to phrase it. However, that's not how I was taught. I seem to like the uh, the explanation that as you elect, as you power up an electromagnet, it puts a warp in space-time, which of course is perfectly logical and pretty well in tune with what physics says, just not what electronics says. And then as you collapse that magnetic field, the area in which it encapsulates also collapses with the magnetic field into the same coil, uh, thereby giving you a gain. You not only get to use the energy in the normal sense, you actually get it back again. And with remarkable efficiency... Plus sum. Yeah, well, actually, I'm not sure the plus sum. I won't give you the plus sum, my friend. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen the plus sum business, um, but you can use it and then use it again. Uh, minus a small quantity, uh, which is quite all right because that does work with the UFO principle. Um, what I've always been curious about though, because recirculating back EMS is no problem, it's really just a matter of switching. Um, but once you create a rotating magnetic field, if you don't mind me changing the topic slightly, uh, to something I'm slightly more interested in, we can bounce this backwards and forwards all day long if you like. It's really, once this field is established, what it actually creates a repelling force from. I mean, I didn't want to peg your definition of the term quote-unquote anti-gravity, but from my understanding, there's actually no such thing, if I may be so bold, as an anti-gravity field. The f I was assuming that your court, I thought that was just a, breeze, you know, a means of explaining the general operating. Um, but a more specific operating principle would be to say it creates a force upon, say, matter, which then propels it away from the Earth. Uh, would I be correct in that assertion?
Not exactly. Oh. Um, look, mass as you know it, as we know it, is organized by another field, and that field is a spirally vortex in dark matter, if you wish. Hmm. It organizes matter that we know much larger than dark matter in, in the average particulate base, organizes us into spherical structures, whether it be a planet, a moon, a star, galaxy, whatever. This organizing fluid spins, but it has convergent waves toward the center of spin, and they reflect back and make divergent waves. Now, the sum, the net sum, the vector sum of these and these generates orbits or ripples, state, uh, like, um, like Lagrange point orbits around a quote-unquote gravitational field, which is the sum of two vectors, energy in the dark, uh, energy flowing in and reflecting back against itself. And this allows um, energy to actually be extracted from any gravitational field because of these two forces. And you ride on one versus the other and are linked between them and you can actually generate energy from the gravitational field because it's not static, it's dynamic. Right, okay, well that's an absolutely gorgeous explanation. I think I can take that to the bank and actually insert that into my current model and actually add something to it. So the gravitational field appears right. in the center, in the very center uh, of these repelling fields that are created as a side effect of a quantity of mass. Um, what I'm a little short of an understanding of is how you create this simulated mass by pulsing coils. All right, <clears throat> let's let's look at the Earth and satellites. Mm. Uh, satellites go up and they achieve a relative speed in orbit around the planet, and they stay there. Mm. If they go out far enough, you are weightless. If they come in closer, they gain weight. Mm. But if you drill a hole down to the center of the Earth, mm. they won't fall all the way to the center of the Earth if you let them. Mm. They will fall down a certain distance and fall back up a bit and back and forth and oscillate till it finds a, null, uh, a zero or null point where gravity is balanced by the divergent convergent wave business which creates gravity, the illusion of it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, mm -hmm. there is zero G inside the planet in that shell. Now, if the Earth was, as I try to explain, about 25% smaller in diameter X thousand years ago than it is now, it would still have the same mass, and it expands now 33% or so of what it was to now, and we still have the same mass, because all of the organized mass of the, the larger uh, molecules are all still in that field. But the further away you get from the surface, the less that effect has. Um, hmm. Percentage-wise, yeah, yeah, you can work out the percents, but anyway, whether hmm. it's small or expanded, and there are like there on the space are station. shells formed within the planet. Right, okay. Um, I understand elements of that, but I'll try and simplify the question. Um, I've actually been fascinated since a childhood of actually making one of these crafts. Um, and there's a huge number of principles I've discovered on which they can operate. Um, now, I've actually got my head around quite a lot of them, and I'm convinced I can make uh, quite a lot of them. Now, uh, yeah, as you, as you indicate, a sort of a fan-powered uh, one, like the Coanda effect, um, is a great effect to add to the pile because it prevents all the problems associated with the electrostatic machines. Let me tell you this. When you pulse a direct current into coil one, which is sharing two vectors through the inductor with coil two, mm -hmm. then then catch the back EMF and add it to the other. When you do this back and forth, what you do is you create a one directional spiraling or textual field that goes a around the center and up over around the coils and back into the crab like this and it forms a, a circulating vortexual toroid. That's what interacts with the torus of the Earth and it has one. 
Gravity spins to the east slightly. Hmm. So would you say the field of the craft is opposite or identical in nature to the field of the Earth? Yeah, depending on the density of the field, you either rise or fall. You set your density by your field density and the craft. And when you fly over mountains where you have differential gra uh, your mass, right. you'll see this flutter effect as it keeps an equipotential gravity as it goes over because it's set at a particular density. It's energy density that does the, the support of the object in the gravitational field. Right, so if I was to pull a 90 radius. degree corner whilst going over the top of this mountain, what would happen? All right, when you are in the field, mm -hmm. your atoms and your craft atoms are spun up. They spin faster. Your, your mass becomes dense. When you go to turn a corner, mm -hmm. you... You can't. You can turn a right angle corner at 20,000 miles an hour, as far as we're concerned. But you change the energy density inside the ship so that, to you, the rate of time passage, which is physical chemical interactions, that slows down immensely. And in essence, while you're turning that corner at what appears to be instantaneous to the observer outside, you are turning it over several minutes. You have time to pour a cup of tea, play a little quick hand of cribbage. And then you're finished with the turn, you blow off the extra energy density, a brilliant burst of light to those on the ground. And to them, it looks like you turned, there was a brilliant flash of light at the same instant, and you're going 90 degrees, 20,000 miles in a different direction. It's be because you amortize the rate of change. You don't change any of the physics equations. You change the denominator, the time spent in reducing the change, you know, the inertial change of their direction by amortizing it over minutes mm -hmm. the crew and the craft inside the field. It's relative. That does make sense. I mean, it does answer what seems to be a very big problem. Um, I'm actually quite scared to go that fast, to be honest. Um, I've got nothing against going quite slowly. I'd like to design a machine where I can go quite slowly and sedately uh, and just simply forego the need for a sort of fuel. Because um, obviously once you leave the confines of the Earth's gravity graphitic field, um, you can really go as fast as you want via whatever means possible. Um, it's really just leaving the Earth's gravity that's the problem. Um, I think you're still constrained by... There's gravity of the Earth, there's gravity of your stellar system. You change your frequency to lock into the gravity of, say, the Sun. It's all frequency. Mm. It's a beautiful notion, I will admit. Um, I was hoping to do it in more of an analog fashion, though. I didn't want to have so many presets on my dashboard. Um. <laughs> it, was a, it was a learning curve for the guys doing it to begin with. I know that when they were flying from California over to Florida one time in the early days in the late 50s, they, uh, they set their, you know, their nav to, to go to, to Florida. And they established the field, and of course, once you're in the field, radio, normal radio communications don't work. Anyway, they calculated the time it would take to gain to the, the velocity they wanted to, and then slow down. And when they slowed down, they found they were out over the Atlantic. They'd overshot by hundreds of miles. And they, they finally figured out that the clocks that they had on board uh, were going relativistic time inside the craft, not outside. And so they had to make arrangements to take care of... of insulating their, their timing mechanism from the field that altered the rate of time passage so they could do the calculation. I'm sure they got uh, very advanced in this time went on, but that was some of the first problems that they encountered. Wow, unless they wanted to bring mathematicians along my deepest sympathies for them, because I bet that was really quite an unpleasant process. Mm -hmm. If you were to go to Stan yeah, Mars... a trial and error, I know that. I mean, you personally, I mean, how, how would you feel about the prospect of a trip to Mars, and what technology would you feel comfortable going in? Because uh, I'm a practical guy with my free energy. I'd machine. like to go on one. Mm. 
Well, you see, you see, you can draw energy from not only the Earth's gravitational field, but from the sun and from the galaxy. It's all a matter of frequency. What frequency works for here will be different than it works for Mars or whatever. Mm -hmm. And of course, you want to go to the closest uh, gravitational field or the strongest. And once you get free of a planet in this system, it's the sun. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, I would like to go by one of those methods because you can draw energy out of the gravitational field to power your gravitic craft. Mm. Which is good because I've always if liked. You have a sail. If you, mm. if you have a sailboat, you don't carry energy with that. You get the wind. You capture the wind. Now the wind blows mm. this way and it blows that way. Mm. So you have to be able to catch the wind. You mechanically do that with your, your yard arm or whatever. You you catch the wind from whatever direction is most efficient to get your sailboat to go forward. Mm. And that's the same in a gravitic field. You, you have two fields operating and they don't operate straight up and down from the surface of wherever you're looking at. Mm. They have a spin to them. And so you balance between those two. You have a foot in one and a foot in the other, a foot in one and a sail in the other. Mm. And that allows you to draw energy from it and move within the field by its own dynamics. Where does the plasma come in, Stan? I'm a big fan of plasma and... The plasma was... Mm. The plasma came in in the early forms. That's what I designed uh, back in the uh, uh, late 60s uh, and that's why I was recruited. But they had already done that and uh, bypassed it in the uh, early 60s in favor of the pure electrogravitic craft. The reason is, is the plasma tended to overheat the seals at the top of the copula and catch fire. And once it did, the smoke from the fire stayed within the bubble, the, the torus that the plasma formed as it moved over the top of the wing and down underneath. And you couldn't get rid of it until you landed and cut off uh, the power. And if the fire was bad enough, you had to have a, another craft come and, and couple you over the top and put you in their field and take you home. So the plasma fields wow. are a, a problem with temperature. They're a problem with the uh, titanium dioxide that you need to be the uh, the capacitive surface, you know, to get the voltage you need at that current up to the core. Um, they just and and also when you get the speed in them, they they didn't have a way to amortize turning corners at high speeds. That was nice. They thought first of all to use uh, centrifugal force in spherical or cylindrical cages like you see at the circus. And that proved to be difficult in power coupling, so and navigation equipment as well. Yeah, I've had a little difficulty attaining the higher voltages required for some of the Stanley Myers tech, which is interesting. That'll be one of my next emails to NASA, I think. Uh, they seem to be having some fuel problems landing on all these various meteors and, and rocks and whatnot flying around out there, um, taking all these uh, various samples of dirt and things. I think if they were to use one of Stanley Meyer's um, propulsion technologies powered by electricity, um, which is not much different to the B-field Brown, they'd probably have a lot less fuel difficulties. Um, and that is essentially just a couple of plates of metal stacked on top of each other that, that have been shown, even by NASA themselves, actually, to produce a propulsive force, albeit only a small one over a long period that of time. Let me explain. The Beefield Brown effect, which Townsend Brown played with after, you know, when he left uh, Beefield Brown, or Beefield, um, the, the effect they're talking about, you can get in a copper wire without going to high voltage. You can get in a copper wire that, uh, let's say, a number 12 gauge copper wire that you hook up across the terminals of a car battery. You run the, the loop of wire up to the ceiling, tape it here, and then run it across to here, tape it there, and then down, so you form a big loop. But up at the ceiling, make it, make that central loop, let's see how it's like, hang down. Okay, so you've got a loop hanging free from the ceiling, and both ends of it are connected by, uh, to, to the battery when you break the, or when you make the, the contact. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take one wire, put it on either side of the battery, it doesn't matter and you tap the other one to make a quick contact, you will see immediately this loop of copper wire hanging down from the ceiling will do this. Twist like that. 
Now then reverse the leads and do the same thing again, you'll see it twists the opposite direction. Now what uh, Vice oh, Brown was finding was a high voltage equivalent of that. It's a torque that generates between, uh, in a direct current, between the inner current mm. and the return current. Now, have you read my paper, the Gemstone uh, 1 gem file? I'm familiar with almost all of your work in the form of video stand, but I must admit I'm not a big reader. So it's called the Gemstone Files. Well, you must go. You, you, yeah, it's, you go to our shopping cart and look for, uh, let me see just a second here, I have to... I don't suppose you fancy emailing me a copy, Stan. I'll, I'll mention it in the NASA email if you fancy. Never know, they might buy a few copies. Hey, baby. Da 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 I'll forego the torrent search, my friend. If you've got a PDF there, that'd be fantastic for later reading. Wait one. Da 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 Hold on. That's okay, I'm vacillating over my next question. I'm going to leave the flying capabilities of Steve Jobs' new yacht for later on, if you don't mind. I'm a big fan of the hunt for Red October, but I think it's travelling through the wrong medium. You missed Perth, Stan. It's really quite lovely here today. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, you do? Hmm. Part of me quite like to drive around the States. I certainly bookmark it for one of these days. I'd like to get some sort of self-sustaining topical business right. off first. Ah, uh, here we go. I think that's the one. Let me just say. Oh, no, so... No, that's not the right one. Where's the B at the main? Can you give me an approximate summary, Stan? What's your multitasking skills like? I'm not sure what we're actually talking about, to be honest. The gemstone files. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> da 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 Hmm. 
they use the inductive collapse for the Supply copy machines in the UFO stand. 15 to 15 megabytes. 15 megabytes, okay, that's fine. The file I'm sending is about 50. Yeah. Ah, oh, thank you, thank it's you. It's on the way. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, whilst I'm constructing my... Coming in. Wow, that would be quite quick, my friend, quite quick indeed. It's coming in, huh? Okay, well, sounds good, my friend. All in good time. So, are there any problems associated with this? To arrive at your place yet? Uh, no, I haven't ticked up just yet. Um, it might take a few minutes, actually. My internet's not particularly fast today. Well, it's sending in. That's good value, Stan. Thank you. Are there any problems? What are the general problems one would associate yeah, with well, it's, building one of these? It's still up. Uh, building one of these magnetic field uh, spinners. I mean, I'm quite aware of a lot of the problems associated with my various uh, design preferences. But what would, what would you say would be the would be the biggest downfalls or the notable downfalls of, of this particular design? This uh, 1950 Fatih uh, Nigger, uh, a friend of mine was his uh, captain, and the navigator made it with coils of wire wrapped around iron rods that were about uh, three inches tall, arranged in circles around a three... three layer piece of, or pieces of a chipboard <laughs> that were layered up like a birthday cake. And Knife connectors, driving circuits to the coils, all and able. The mm -hmm. connectors were to 1950s allergy. He was able to generate the pulses he needed. These coils carrying a common um, inductor, which was the iron core, and it, he watched, and nothing seemed to be happening. Mm -hmm. So then, all of a sudden, it started to raise up slightly above his table, mm -hmm. and it was kind of the air was kind of grayish colored. He said it wasn't full color underneath it, mm. and it kept him rising. So he reached for the switch off the knife blades and could driver circuit to the coil on the table there. As he lifted up the knife blades, high voltage jumped out from the connectors and kept it connected. He couldn't shut it off. So then he took a broom, a wooden handle thinking it wouldn't conduct, and struck the field on rising platform of these coils. Mm. And he said it felt like hitting something made of really thick jello. And as he did that, there was a huge surge into his circuits across the knife blades and burned his circuits. The thing collapsed the circuit, blew out the, the transformer out there by the, the power company. So that was the earliest method made. And I put pictures of that up on my website a number of times. Uh, and I don't know why this thing is not sending. It's taking a bite of it, taking a bite of it. This is not right. Let me just stop the transfer and do another little thing here. Hmm. Put this into a compressor. What do you feel the most noticeable things happening with our planet at the moment, Stan? Is it? I mean, the internet sales obviously one, but more from a more from a rock and sort of rock and water and sort of air point of view. Hold on, I'm doing something here just a second. Sure, my friend, sure. I'm doing this. You don't mind if I smoke? Why not? It is the weekend, my friend. It is the weekend. I do allow myself such an accommodation from time to time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brave new world, Stan. I'm not sure whether I should install air filters or water dams or... 
or a big a lot of my baked beans, frankly. Yeah. Mm. Hold on. I zipped it to see if that'd make it work better. And it looks to be taking its time now, then, which means it may transfer. Some some um, email transfer programs along the way may get excited if I send a PDF with normal characters in it rather than a zip file. But we can override that and at the moment about 10% of it has been uploaded to the email right. server. So Software we'll seems to come with a sense of humor these days. It does seem to be extremely intelligent, my friend. It really does. It seems to cover all the bases somehow. It seems to decide what you want and then do it for you to a large what degree. The? Uh, modern software, <laughs> I find. It does, right. it does have an intelligence right. all of its own. So much to the point it actually seems not to have one. It's well surpassed the old test for an AI. Almost human. Uh-huh. Just looking for something. Hold on. This one is it. That's brown stuff. Hmm. Okay, let's get the other one from the craft. I appreciate the time stand. I imagine you're a busy man. Well, very shortly I'm going to have to cut this off and get ready for the show, but uh, I'll uh, send this across in a minute here. Mm, rest assured, I'll listen tonight. Yeah. I do enjoy Coast to Coast very much. All right. Okay, that's 300. Okay, let's try that again here. Okay, Patty. And this one here. This one goes. <laughs> Gotta check the out. Hmm. All right, we're um, seventy percent on the other one. Excellent. What type of water do you drink, Stan, in your neck of the woods? If you don't mind me asking, is it is it filtered water? Filtered water. You've got a purifier in your house, huh? Oh, excellent. They do seem to remove the mineral base. We use the Berkey flavors. water filters. Of oh, the Berkeys, right? Yeah, I hear good things. Alex has been going on about them for some time. He doesn't ship them to Australia. They which don't I'm a remove. Little... Yeah. I'm well, not... they don't uh, take all the minerals out. They do filter a lot of the bacteria and biological. <laughs> that is a very intelligent filter. I must admit, if you ship them to Australia, I'd absolutely buy one. I was thinking about making my own still, though. I suppose it'd cover a few bases at once. I'd quite like to run my car on alcohol. It seems more convenient than hydrogen somehow. You... Well, why don't, why don't you uh, email them over at Berkey Water, they're just across the mountain from us here, uh, and ask them if they have an agent in Australia yet, because I know they've been exploring a possibility. I think they do quite well. Our water filters are really not up to global standards, I don't think. They tend to provide very little more than a dribble of water for what could fairly be termed a flood of input. Uh, they're not particularly efficient. I think that we're generally dissuaded mm. from using them. Okay, you should be uh, notified of an email coming in now. Finish the transfer here. Oh, look at that stand. Fantastic. I'll try out our new national broad... Oh, wait a minute. No, sorry, I tell a lie. That was an email from somebody else. I sent you... Uh, well, 
I sent two to you. The second one is much smaller, so it might come bigger. I don't know. Okay. Oh, no, quite right. There we go. Yeah, thank you very much, my friend. We've got our 14 meg gemstone file. And uh, so what's the topic of conversation on Coast to Coast this evening? Is that the general... Oh, I don't know. I'm just doing an earthquake. Uh, I... Do you want to give me a free yeah. uh, exclusive preview on tonight's show? No, I haven't. I haven't. Um, uh, mine's only a three-minute portion. I do that every now and then when we have earthquake uh, information. And so I'm not the main show tonight. I couldn't tell you what the main show is. All right. Do, do you foresee any problems the in the next ten years or so? Say, look, can, can you? What if I was to say between, say, say fifty? Again? If I was to say between fifty and hundred years, would you foresee any significant problems? Uh, upcoming for humanity in general. I'd say more like the next five months. Five months? These are... Serious stuff. Right. This is... Yeah. Earthquake and Yellowstone sort this of... This is my estimate. It's not a forecast. No, this is... Um, well, yeah, like, I mean... Uh, a nuclear war uh, in the Middle East. Um... Um, right. An ISIS series of attacks in the United States, civil war here, uh, martial law here, hmm. uh, chaos for a few months, and then invasion by Russia and China here with the help of Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are a number of issues that are coming to a head in the next five to six months. As far as earthquakes, okay, they're increasing. Hmm. Volcanoes will be increasing. I think New Zealand's going to have a lot of problems. Right, I mean, that should generate quite a lot of yep, jobs, though. Eventually, but... Uh, I imagine they'll keep the... Uh, quite a lot of what? Oh, quite a lot of uh, employment uh, for the locals. I imagine they'll keep the death toll to a, to a minimum. I mean, we have got you know, quite a few people on the planet. It shouldn't, you know, devastate our ability to perpetuate the species too badly. And it will create quite a lot of jobs for those who are left, which is arguably quite a good thing, um, provided the conscious of those who actually... There's a lot... I feel fairly isolated from oddly enough. Do you know why we kept the anti-gravity from you? Well, largely because of its ease of construction would be my primary guess. I mean, having looked inside the old television, You're too uh, young. an anti-gravity craft seems right. Right. Yeah. I quite like being young, though, I do admit. Um, I mean, I feel fairly wise in my youth. I don't see myself using it to, you know, drop bombs or anything unpleasant of that nature. I mean, all you can do is really drop bombs on another planet. I mean, that's really the only advantage gleaned by anti-gravity, I would think. But it is, you know, from a childhood, childish perspective, it is quite exciting to actually you know, harness the power of this technology. I mean, to see things float in front of you, it's like the magic you feel with magnets. Uh, except arguably more practical. And I do plan to have a go at it one day, Stan. There's quite a few technologies on the internet right now that can be glued together to provide a lightweight craft that does actually float around and use no energy whatsoever. I mean, as soon as I've got the lights in my house working, I'll certainly plan to have a go at that. I don't really find it all that controversial either, to be honest. It's hard to imagine any particular political group that would genuinely uh, dissuade us from using such technology. I mean, in my experience, the um, the Freemasons and all these uh, these groups that have been in control of knowledge for so many hundreds of years actually have our best interests in mind. So I do hold up the idea that whatever they do have in plan for us is actually for the best. 
It's really only the people who want to profiteer on unpleasantness uh, that concern me. I have a, se a sneaky suspicion that um, the, undergro the underground world of, of uh, secret empires and secret clubs actually really want us to have this technology these days as it would free us from uh, their arch rivals. Um, and their arch rivals seem largely interested in nothing more than making money. Uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. I suspect they're not in all that intelligent, to be honest. Um, they seem to be struck by the same curse that affects most displeasant people, which is largely greed. And uh, humble people wearing flip-flops and flying around in modest wooden UFOs don't seem to pose all that much of a threat. Um, unless, of course, they start making them out of various exotic materials, that might be somewhat of their downfall. Otherwise, it might, well, you know, create some sort of um, barrage of opposition to their plans, which is largely to make money. Um, however, if I was to run an airline with these crafts, I rest assured it would be well in line with the costs. Uh, my fees, that is. And... Uh, it shouldn't really disrupt the global norms all that much. I'm really stretching for reasons that they would dislike this technology coming out. Um, I mean, I tend to think that if we can determine, you know, the logic of choices simply by the advantages that it gives the few, we should be able to really you know, determine the inputs and the outputs of uh, the bad people uh, defined by what they're doing and that should really determine what they wish to gain and the goals of what they do should give us a clue as to what the plan is and at the moment it really just seems like make money um, however what they plan to do with that money uh, eludes me um, so I tend to think it's just a large portion of rich people have been promised a lot of money which they now have and don't know what to do with. Uh, they just find themselves having trouble sleeping at night, which is a real shame. But I buy smoked salmon for $25 a kilo. And, you know, a loaf of bread is quite cheap and electricity, you get that plug in the wall. And unless they take their internet away from us, I won't really be getting what annoyed, to be honest. And frankly, we can create another internet for about $2.50. Uh, given that all the cables are already there. So, my friend, I actually feel quite comfortable about the future, to be honest. I mean, the paperwork I'm not a big fan of, but I will, you know, as I said, hire some sort of consultant to take care of that. But it's a lovely haircut you have there, Stan. Is that a comb-over? I mean, that's really my biggest problem in life these days, is really determining what to do with my hair, to be honest. Well, we boy, I don't know what to tell you, except that you need to have read more, and I outlined it all in the Cosmic Conspiracy book. Um, you just don't understand what's about to happen. Or don't want to, I'm not sure. No, well, do you know anything about the earthquake that happened in West Australia? Um, there was one inexplicable earthquake that, to my knowledge, should never have occurred because we don't have any fault lines. Um, but there's you a do. we do we do have fault lines. Yes, um, American teams of seismologists. When I was there in '78, '79, mm -hmm. uh, detonated a number of. Uh, TNT charges up north of, of uh, Perth to avoid Richter for 7 to 7.8 earthquake striking Perth because most of the buildings there were built before the will come down. Uh, mm. You know, we this was uh, coordinated through Pine Gap and the teams were sent out with uh, jeeps and whatever to relieve the stress on the fault line when they got into Perth. Right. It's a rather precarious thing. And, well, it has often puzzled me what yeah. did cause that earthquake, because in 78 there was actually an earthquake. And to my knowledge, that really shouldn't be possible. And it's startling that it would actually be caused by a fault line. I always imagine that it um, was perhaps 
like a water aquifer underground, some some sort of clay collapsed into a water aquifer or something along those lines, and it actually had little to do with the fault line. Um, uh, well, I can't go into that now. I don't have time. I've got to sign off up in about a minute here because I'm getting ready for uh, the show. Well, it's lovely to talk to you, Stan. I'll it's tell you what. I'll put up the image. Once I've got my website up, I'll send you a link if you don't mind, and uh, yeah, you can have a look at the technology and have a bit of a smile. And I'm going to send it out to NASA and a bunch of government institutions, and they're going to have a good read. All right. And um, yeah, should be should be an amusing little thing to keep an eye on. All right. So yeah, my friend, bless you. I won't hold right. you up any longer, yeah. and I thoroughly look forward to coast to coast tonight. So uh, take care, Stan. Be well, my friend. Be well. Alrighty. Take care. Say hi to Holly for me. She's a darling. Yep. Okay. Oh, still recording. <laughs>